Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Myself, Daniel, representing PMS Bazaar. I welcome you all for the insightful session on uh, dynamic asset allocation, the smarter way to uh, navigate market volatility. On behalf of the participants, I welcome Mr. Siddhar Pura from Prabhuda Siladhar. Uh, before we proceed, let me give a, a quick introduction about uh, Siddhar. Siddhar is the head of quantitative investment strategy and fund manager at Prabhuda Siladhar. He was instrumental in developing. Prabhuda Siladhar quantitative uh, proprietary module by conceptualizing and spearheading multi asset dynamic portfolios, which is a nimble and broadly diversified portfolio which has over two and a half decades of history worldwide and it's uh, catching up in India in a big way, which has more than 12.5 trillion USD in assets under management. Siddharth is a CA and CFA chartered holder as well as MSc in management of uh, business excellence with studies at uh, world renowned universities such as. Harvard and London School of Economics. So uh, now I know uh, it will be more like sort of a, a Q and A uh, session. And uh, uh, before we move to uh, before we proceed, I request Sita to you know uh, give a brief introduction about this uh, multi asset dynamic portfolios, and then probably we'll start with uh, sort of uh, questions which will be benefiting the participants. Great. So, firstly, uh, welcome to everybody who's uh, taken our time to attend this session. And thank you so much, uh, Daniel and the PMS Bazaar team, for giving us this opportunity to help investors uh, protect their capital in these tough times and navigate market volatility with a lot of ease. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole concept of dynamic asset allocation and why that is the smartest way to navigate volatility on the upside and on the downside. Uh, but before I get there, <clears throat> a little bit uh, about Prabhudas Leeladhar, uh, the company that we belong to. So we have been in the capital markets business since 1944. And with nearly eight decades of experience and wisdom that we bring to the table, we wish that all investors uh, can benefit from our diverse teams, our leading research DNA, and the trust that we've brought in the industry for the last so many years. And uh, now I think it's time we can start the Q&A and uh, talk about how asset allocation is relevant in today's times, even more than it has been in the last decade. Over to you, Daniel. So, Yeah, see, uh, uh, in the testing time like this, so how do you manage the multiple risk and uh, control uh, portfolio volatility through your, you know, uh, your you know, portfolio strategies? Sure. So firstly, uh, let us understand what the risks are and where the risks come from. So risks are usually external in terms of macro, monetary, inflation, geopolitical, but the volatility is internal to the portfolio. So our job as fund managers is to manage these risks and control the volatility. If we have a look at what's happened you know, year to date in the world across asset classes, it seems extremely evident that whether it is bonds, government bonds, corporate bonds, equity indices around the world, it's been an extremely hard year. Uh, all the assets have uh, given up a lot of the returns made in the last two years. And there is a very clear trend that equity indices and risk on assets are out of favor today. We also need to understand why this is happening and how this can be managed. So I think a uh, couple of points here. Firstly, uh, because of COVID, the Fed balance sheet had expanded almost to $9 trillion, which has been a historic high. And managing that kind of debt, it's extremely difficult. And to manage it, what we've started now is come from a quantitative easing cycle, then gone on to tapering. And now we are actually on the cusp of tightening. And tightening is we are just starting this cycle. And when we go into a rate hike cycle, many uh, spillover impacts can be clearly visible. For example, borrowing becomes more expensive. Inflation that is already at highs is compressing uh, corporate earnings. And, and a combination of this can be seen in contracting PE multiples because as your discounting cost or your discounting factor goes up, the first impact is on PE multiples. And this is a double whammy because inflation is hitting margins and therefore compressing earnings. 
Combined with that, we are seeing rate hikes, which is also going to hit multiples. So it is uh, a dicey situation on managing pure equities. And therefore, we believe asset allocation could really help in such a period. If we look at some of the emerging themes uh, globally, and uh, this is what the data is telling us, that <clears throat> till 2021, the concern was around inflation and reflation. As we stand in 2022, the talk is more about stagflation. Stagflation is basically a combination of slowing economic growth and rising inflation. And this is an extremely rare phenomenon. And it's happened only a couple of times in history so far. Uh, if we look at uh, what the data suggests, all the uh, large countries and economies are actually dealing with inflation numbers way higher than their central bank targets. So this is challenging. Other than that, if we see how the IMF is uh, projecting the world to move ahead, across the board, emerging economies or advanced tech developed economies, they've slashed down GDP forecasts. So therefore, growth is uh, a concern. And at the same time, they've increased their inflation forecasts. So if we see for 23, uh, inflation forecasts have been uh, revised from 4.8% to 6.5% for emerging economies. Similarly, uh, GDP forecast has been cut from, say, 4.7 to 4.4 for 23 and 4.8 to 3.8 for 22. So this is uh, a difficult macro and monetary combination that we are facing. And uh, another factor that we need to understand in terms of the risks building up in the system is also valuation. Uh, given the flux of liquidity that we saw post-COVID, a lot of growth stocks uh, and momentum stocks did really, really well. And overall, risk on assets performed very well. Over the last six months, what we've started noticing is that valuations and value as a factor in investing has started becoming relevant all again. And therefore, we must be able to decipher not just how the macro and monetary regimes are evolving, but also how to be conscious on the valuation front. We cannot be paying too much for an asset whose earnings might compress or the discounting rate might go up. Therefore, the multiples we give to those earnings might, might collapse. And uh, even when we look at um, Indian markets, we see that crude has a negative bearing on how GDP growth numbers, inflation, and current account deficits are impacted. So what we've collected here is that every 10% rise in oil prices shaves off 0.2% of GDP, distorts the current account balance by 0.3%, and increases in inflation by 40 basis points. So as of now, we are in a crude, uh, crude rise environment, and we need to be aware of these risks also. Other than that, uh, weak INR will cause higher imported input costs and higher imported inflation. Therefore, it will put more pressure on companies and businesses that are dependent on imported raw materials or uh, commodities for that matter. And the last thing we need to also see is that commodity inflation is at historic highs right now. And as of now, there are no trends of this reversing. This is probably a combination of the geopolitical tension in Russia and Ukraine. At the same time, the lockdowns in China also have some impact. So at this point of time, it is very important to understand how to really move ahead through these cycles and what is the right mix of assets that help us navigate. So here I've put a very sno uh, short snapshot of how we move asset class and risk based on the different cycles we are in. So right now, uh, we're looking at uh, monetary tightening in the short term where interest rates are going up and therefore a clear focus must be on inflation proofing. If it's an equity investor, inflation proofing becomes very important. From an asset allocation perspective, overnight uh, money market funds and short duration uh, debt instruments become very relevant in the portfolio. We have come from a cyclical growth and recovery phase basically. So right now we are here and probably also between these two zones and therefore the asset mix should be tilted towards infl inflation proofing, monetary market, I um, mean, money market funds, and government bonds and gold. And we are both coming from here, which is commodities, cyclical stocks, risk on assets, and growth companies. So it's very important to understand that the dynamics and the paradigm has shifted for the visible future. And therefore, the portfolios must also reflect this shift. 
<clears throat> so now coming to how we really do it. So this is a snapshot from 2007 till 2022. How all the different asset classes have performed, and how does an asset allocation approach, whether conservative, aggressive, moderate, or dynamic, which is our fund, how do they perform in these cycles? So basically, uh, if we look at Uh, aggressive moderate and conservative across all the years we've been in the median and above median category never too low never too high but the whole uh, point of multi asset dynamic is consistency stability and peaceful sleep at night so you don't have to worry about what's happening in the markets your capital beyond a point will be protected and we generate alpha with capital arbitrage here. so every time there's a huge drawdown in the markets and our portfolios are not in risk assets we basically have double the capital to deploy at those lower levels and that is what helps us generate alpha over different cycles uh up yeah. to you so start like uh, uh in terms of you know uh, dynamic asset allocation so how actually it's uh, you know helping you to generate alpha in a falling market as well as in the rising so as i just uh, touched upon so alpha is generated via the concept of capital arbitrage so in bad markets we tend to erode less and we protect capital to a greater extent than a single asset approach we have more capital to deploy at lower levels to ride up the cycles and therefore generate higher alpha across market cycles and uh, because this is dynamic in nature and there's an element of uh, tactical changes in the asset allocation we believe that riding cycles and being agile is very important you cannot have a very static approach uh, here and i think the biggest source of alpha is eliminating sector risks eliminating style risks and eliminating stock selection risk focusing purely on asset allocation because we believe 90 95% of returns are actually contributed by the asset allocation decision itself and therefore being in the right asset at the right time with the right exposure helps us navigate cycles better obviously uh, we also don't get it all right but over a long period of time our attempt is to get most of it right and i believe our historic tests and live performance do suggest that we are fairly on the right track as of now and uh, just to illustrate on the point of you know eliminating risks that is an extremely important part of managing uh, volatility at the portfolio level so what we've done here is uh, we identified the different sources of risk that could be built into a portfolio for example uh, stock uh, sector selection and style selection risk so firstly these are eliminated by going into passive instruments and if we look at the data i think this is the last 3 months uh, nifty 500 has fallen 7.5% in the last 3 months which is like the broad equity index of india it's 2.7 times more than how much madp has fallen in the similar period another important statistic to understand is 69% of nifty 500 stocks have fallen more than twice the fall in madp in the last 3 months and 49% of nifty 500 stocks which is almost half of the nifty 500 stocks have eroded four times the wealth of mdp so the idea is by sticking to a passive and dynamic asset allocation approach we are able to control these uh, market falls and to a huge extent other than that the next risk we talk about is sector selection so here we've just populated all the different sectoral indices and how they have performed so if you look at 3 months mdp has is down say 2.8% but 2.8% is much better than all the other indexes which have fallen between 10 to 15%. So the idea is to systematically eliminate each of these risks and therefore protect capital. And the last risk that we try to avoid is uh, a pure play asset selection risk. What I mean by that is when I am extremely uh, heavily concentrated on a single asset class my returns tend to be volatile in the short to medium term and therefore also reduce long term caggers by that extent a multi asset approach on the other hand helps you reach that same destination of superior consistent returns but the journey journey is extremely smooth that's the real point here so again if we look at 3 uh, months data 
we're down say 2.8 percent but most of the other asset classes are down much higher including gilt can you imagine gilt is down 1.8 percent because of uh, the rate hike cycle that we went through corporate bonds are down nasdaq is down all the asset classes are down right now but the idea is by shifting the mix we try to drive this uh, volatility through what do you then see uh, uh, over the long term uh, do you think uh, passive fund management can outperform active fund management sir oh uh, yes i do believe so and i'll show that with data uh, so this is uh, a snapshot basically where <clears throat> we've seen that even in india so as on the western markets this trend is uh, widely popular where uh, passive funds are outperforming active funds and also gaining the lion's share in terms of aum so if we look at uh, the data here there has been a very very clear and evident shift in terms of investor preference from active to passive in 1998 uh, the passive mix of total aum in the us was say at 11% moved to 2019 we are already at 50% in terms of passive and the early data uh, that we are getting for 2022 shows that we are north of 69% in terms of passive mix of the total aum so this is what the western economies and the developed markets are showing us and this is partly because of lower cost of passive at the same time western markets are way more efficient so as the markets keep becoming more efficient and the information arbitrage reduces what we tend to see is that generating alpha becomes harder over the last 5 years we have also seen this trend starting in india if you see the spree of the new passive funds that are being launched by all the amcs you will understand how things are changing on ground and in terms of uh, performance numbers what we've noticed here is that roughly 80 85% of actively managed funds are not able to beat the passive benchmarks itself when the performance is not there why would you justify a higher cost right so passive instruments gives you the ability to reduce your cost at the same time eliminate style bias sector bias and stock selection bias and we believe over the next few decades passive is going to become extremely massive in india like it has in western economies okay so uh, uh, what are the proprietary quant methods used by you to manage the asset allocation in such uh, dynamic and uh, uncertain times like this uh so this is uh, basically the secret sauce and the entire architecture which is used to navigate uh, asset allocation and it's basically the core of the product and if investors understand how this model works what are the constituents that drive asset allocation the conviction to go for an asset allocation strategy goes up 10x so i'll start with uh, explaining the way we look at equity investments right so whenever we are evaluating a stock we look at couple of simple parameters whether it's the quality of the business the management uh, the balance sheet strength and quality cash flows growth and valuations these are broadly some of the common factors we look at across quality growth and valuation even when we are doing asset allocation the concept remains the same that we need to understand what drives asset classes what drives cycles of these asset classes and what factors help us identify inflection points in these asset classes so we've tried to decode this whole piece and uh, the first factor which we believe is extremely important on a long cycle basis is economy itself so we have a proprietary tool called the macrometer which focuses purely on understanding economic cycles and where we are in part of the economic cycle are we in a strong growth regime are we in a steady growth regime are we in deceleration recovery or slow down and the macrometer understands not just the domestic economic cycle but also the global economic cycle and therefore gives us a strong perspective on how asset allocation should be done keeping the economic cycle in mind uh the next factor which is extremely important is the monetary cycle because monetary cycle gives us a view on the interest rate regime the liquidity and the broad money supply in financial markets and 
as we all know from experience and data that liquidity and interest rate regimes have a significant impact on the performance of the different asset classes so obviously uh, falling interest rates higher liquidity is beneficial for risk on assets and rising interest rates lower liquidity is uh, detrimental for risk of assets but even when we look at fixed income instruments uh, the monetary regime has severe implications whether government bonds which are extremely long duration corporate bonds which are short duration and uh, overnight funds which are extremely short duration so which part of the regime we are in and how to navigate even the fixed income allocation is extremely important for example right now we are overweight on short duration and completely out of long duration bonds so we are more tilted towards liquid and corporate bonds rather than gilt funds so that is the implication in terms of asset allocation similarly the third factor and the third tool that we use is the cyclometer which helps us gauge equity market cycles and as we all know uh, we have come from a highly overvalued uh, market cycle into a, a overvalued or fairly valued kind of zone as of now but we believe uh, the way markets and economies are evolving the valuations are still not comfortable and therefore we are cautious now the way this model works is we have uh, three different long cycle indicators which is the macro meter the monetary meter and the cyclometer and six different short cycle indicators which help us capture momentum technical risk reward sentiment relative valuation and global risk appetite so the whole bucket when it comes together it tries to identify the different risks and opportunities in the system and therefore gives us asset allocation as the final output now the way the model works is we do not use either of these indicators in isolation all of them are used in a combination and therefore if uh, the economy is strong but the momentum in equities is waning or the technical risk reward is not favorable or the sentiment is weakening then the asset allocation gets adjusted accordingly so we dynamically monitor the model on a daily basis and we tend to rebalance only if we get a regime change signal so we do not rebalance our portfolios on a day to day basis every time a significant material regime change is captured that is when we go about rebalancing the portfolio fine so what's your model indicating right now so that uh, based on your different fund meters used and can that help to navigate the periods like this Uh, and uh, does this uh, no uh, uh, quant meters had given any sort of indication about the recent uh, correction in the market okay so i'll come to that so i have put a snapshot of all the readings the critical readings of the meters between june 21 to may 22 so what we've seen is that the economy has grow, gone from deceleration to steady growth and now to slow down so that's a indicator of weakness the monetary cycle has gone from expansionary to contractionary again a sign of weakness the cyclometer if you see the third one it was overvalued then reached highly overvalued zone which our model captures as a peak formation zone and peak formation doesn't mean that on the day it captures next day it forms a peak it doesn't work like that it's a zone so if you see between say october november december jan we've been in that zone and our models have been telling us to be light on equity and keep trimming exposure at higher levels and now we have gradually moved to a fairly valuation fairly valued zone but the trend is still deceleration so when we are in fairly valued and the trend captures acceleration that is when we can gradually move our equity exposures up so i believe the first two indicators itself have kept us very cautious uh, on our equity exposures uh even the momentum has been continuously telling us since december to move out of equities so invest in fi refers to invest in fixed income then it's gradually moved to invest in gold it had triggered a uh, temporary invest in nasdaq but that fizzled out and moved back to invest in gold so this is how the momentum tool also helps us capture where to position our asset allocation 
uh technometer has also been telling us uh mixed signals but as of now since feb it's been a sell uh buy for so mid caps buy in april again and then sell in may so the idea is not to look at any of these indicators on an isolated basis we have our base indicators which is macro monetary and cyclo and then they are supported with momentum relative value risk off and technometers so these tools actually help us navigate uh this difficult period with fair amount of ease i would say right. and uh, i'll also take you how our asset allocation has moved so say in january say we were 65% portfolio in equities 18% in debt 11% in gold and say 4% in liquid this mix over the time has actually changed to 42% equities 29% debt 15% gold and 12.5% liquid so this is basically showing you how over over the times the asset allocation has changed and how dynamic the model has been uh, in terms of rebalancing uh, to give you two particular examples <clears throat> in january itself we had sharply increased our gold allocation from 8% to 20% almost and uh 45 50 days ago when the markets had uh, gone across the 18000 level uh because the hdfc twins had the merger event and the markets were pulled up because of that our sentiment tool captured that because it's the index move is driven by only a very few stocks the polarization is high the breadth is low and the move is unsustainable given we are already in a highly overvalued zone so that was the day it triggered us to trim almost 10% of equities so north of 18000 we trimmed almost 10% of equities and since then we've been extremely comfortable on our equity allocation and we are way below our benchmark which is still at 50% we are at like 40 42% in terms of our equity allocations so what do you think So, uh, so that when when your indicator gives you no know, uh, probably a weakness uh, for equity uh, allocation or equity market. So will you in the position or will you exit completely from the equity uh, side or you will uh, gradually reduce the position? So we don't take uh, sharp decisions in terms of trimming portfolio from eighty percent to ten percent or fifteen percent overnight. That's not how it works. It works in a staggered manner and. Uh, i don't think our model is uh, built in a way that overnight you know we sharply reduce or increase exposures so i think we stagger it in 10 10% kind of uh, moves then uh, with the rising crude prices and commodity inflation across the board so how is your portfolio insulated from this uh, so that okay uh so there are a couple of things here so firstly allocation to gold in a rising crude inflation and commodity environment acts as a significant inflation hedge uh also when interest rates are rising minimal allocation to long duration gold funds is extremely critical over the last 8 months our allocation to long duration bonds have been at 2 to 1/2% versus short duration north of 10 15 20% also so the idea here is uh staying put in gold uh not being exposed to long duration funds and higher allocation to short duration uh, debt securities liquid and cash instruments and uh, till the data doesn't suggest any change in macro or uh, regimes we are also going to be underweight on equities itself so given that we are dealing with inflation economic slowdown rising interest rates i think an underweight on equities overweight on short duration is how our strategy is dealing with rising crude commodity inflation etc and the important thing also is that this is a very peculiar scenario where equities and long duration bonds both show positive correlation so they start falling together so it is not possible to really you know avoid any downside the best that a multi asset approach can do is significantly curb your downside so if your equity portfolio is say down 20 25% we could probably stop at 5 10% and that is the differential we can create in a bad cycle like this. so uh, with a sharp 
erosion seen in the nasdaq will nifty also mimic the correction what's the impact can international exposure have on your portfolio so that okay uh so firstly i would say that it's uh, not really right to compare uh, nasdaq and nifty uh, given the constituents are different nasdaq is uh, long duration future growth tech companies and in a rising interest rate environment valuations of all these long duration asset classes will contract be it equities or debt on the other hand nifty 50 is a well diversified index and not focused on tech companies also even if you see the broader uh, valuation cash flow and growth visibility profile of the nifty index i think it is much more stable than nasdaq we can however compare s&p 500 to nifty to a certain extent because if you look at the data s&p 500 is uh, down about 17 18% from the recent highs and nifty is down also 15% from the recent highs in the exact same period nasdaq is down more like 28 30% so comparing nasdaq to nifty is uh, not really an apples to apples comparison and uh, global markets are correlated but not co integrated and that means that if a certain market falls by x percent it is not necessary that uh, nifty also falls or indian markets also fall by the same percent the problem of inflation i would say is much more serious in the us than in india an economic outlook for india over the next 3 to 5 years i think it is the best compared to most of the other emerging markets and developed markets so it is not necessary that domestic equity indices might fall in line with global indices in the current cycle that we are in and uh, given that our allocation to nasdaq is very meager so we were 8% in say 2021 we are down to 4 4.5% as of now so i think we are fairly covered given the currency tailwinds by strengthening dollar that the nasdaq uh, etf also provides so what we need to understand is the rupee denominated nasdaq index which we invest in versus the dollar denominated nasdaq index which is the global representative so we still have some uh, currency tailwinds here and we might be better off than the pure play uh, nasdaq so overall with a very very small allocation say 4 5% to nasdaq i think the overall portfolio is fairly insulated right so that so uh, so now we have a uh, uh, couple of uh, questions from the participants so probably you know uh, i'll read out uh, so probably you can address their uh, queries so uh, navnita ashmira has asked like how exactly does a dynamic asset allocation work uh, if you could give a numeric example that will help okay okay so if you could give some numerical example for example he say having 100 rupees so how that you uh, know uh, a dynamic asset allocation will work so that's what his okay. question is so so this is how the asset allocation works very clearly i'm going to be able to explain it uh, so there are two components to the portfolio there is a fixed component and there is a tactical component the fixed component includes uh, all these asset classes such as one second sorry the nifty 50 the nifty junior the mid cap us equity gold corporate bonds gilt and liquid in a certain predefined ratio as per our model the fixed component is a long term in nature and that changes only once in a year if our model captures a huge regime change so the fixed component is your long term capital tax component and the tactical component which is the other 50% is dynamic in nature and the dynamic uh, component has two parts to it the core and the satellite the core is driven by long term indicators such as uh, cyclometer macrometer and a couple of short term indicators such as momentum and technometer other than that there is a 30% satellite allocation within the tactical component right and the tactical satellite is driven purely by sentiment and therefore we could be able to manage 15% of your total portfolio absolutely based on tactical cues that we get from our models and therefore <clears throat> you have one part of your portfolio which is stable long term and diversified and the other part of your portfolio which is dynamically adjusted 
to capture the broader changes in the macro, monetary, and valuation regimes. To give an example of how asset allocation moves through the life portfolio, I think uh, this represents since Jan 2006 till now, till 2022, how the asset allocation has changed across cycles and across, across uh, periods. So the blue year represents Nifty. The, yellow, the dark yellow represents junior. This one represents mid caps, uh, S&P 500, NASDAQ, gold, corporate bonds, gilt, and liquid. So over the cycles, uh, we've seen that our model is able to dynamically move in and out of asset classes for the tactical component of the portfolio. And the idea to do this is only control risk and have more capital when outlook is favorable. That is the simple way the strategy works. Yeah, and uh, we uh, have received the same question from uh, Indranil as well as Jayan. So they were asking like, once the weightage of allocation of a particular asset class has been finalized, uh, how do you shortlist these stocks uh, within the asset class? So do you have as any said, parameters or anything uh, to be... Okay. Uh, so as I said, we do not invest in stocks. We do not, do not invest in sectors. We do not invest in any direct equity instrument. The only investment is made via passive instruments. And uh, the passive instruments in our portfolio include the Nifty 50 index fund or ETF, the Nifty junior index fund or ETF, the mid cap 150 index fund or ETF, the S&P 500, NASDAQ ETF, gold, gilt fund, corporate bond via Bharat bond and liquid funds. So the only call we need to take is on allocating your capital across these asset classes via index funds and ETFs alone. And there is no stock sector, anything in this portfolio. Okay. So uh, uh, what are the returns that you know, one can look at, you know, uh, five year view and 10 year view if they are you know, opting for this uh, dynamic asset election portfolio? Okay. So what can happen? I will get to that in a moment but first let's look at what's ha what has happened so if we look at three year and five year regimes let's uh, look at five years to start with so the best five year CAGR for uh, a strategy like uh, MADP has been 23.6% net of expenses fees in fact cost everything the worst five year CAGR has been 7.6% the median has been 13.7 and the average has been in the range of 15% the standard deviation is at 8.4%, which is significantly lower, almost half of most of the risk on asset classes that we see. Now, what is really important to understand is that when we are going through the worst five-year cycle at 7.6%, Nifty returns for that same five-year cycle is minus 0.9%. Mid cap for that same five-year cycle is minus 1.6%. Small cap for that same five-year cycle is minus 7.4%. So in challenging cycles also, a dynamic asset allocation approach has been able to give us a five-year CAGR of 7.6%. Now, if we look at a shorter cycle, which is three years, the worst has been 6.6% CAGR, best has been 31.9% CAGR, median and average is in the 14 to 16% range. But again, I focus my uh, conclusion on the worst returns. Because when we are delivering, say, 6.6 .6 as our lowest return, what has the other asset classes delivered? So gold is negative 8.2. Nifty is negative 1.5. Junior base is negative 3.8. Mid cap is negative 9.5. Small cap is negative 16% on a three-year CAGR basis. So, and S&P 500 is also negative 7.9. So what is important to understand is that 6.6 .6 is a low number. But we are delivering 6.6 .6 when all the other asset classes are delivering much more uh, inferior number and even going to put investors through capital erosion. And that is the important point to understand. Now coming to our outlook from here on, <clears throat> I think genuinely this is the most appropriate time for an asset allocation approach with all the macro monetary developments paving way for a much tougher market than we've seen in the last 24 months. To navigate this uncertainty, I believe a dynamic asset allocation would definitely outperform the broader equity and debt indexes also, given 
that we are not taking a pure play risk on a single asset class the developments that are happening around the world whether geopolitical monetary or macro they are so fast and dynamic that managing volatility and drawdowns is 100% more important than actually trying to generate returns so every time you have to mentally position yourself that do i want to generate very high returns or do i want to be conservative and market cycles over the long term give you both opportunities but you have to be cautious and wise to know this is my time to protect money this is my time to grow money and right now the way the data is telling us it is the time to be cautious to protect money and make sure when things improve we have enough capital to redeploy for growth another thing i would say is uh, investors must tone down their return expectation in times like these and i say this right now because everybody is used to the two year of speedy high returns that we've seen and that might not continue in the visible future and therefore the focus must shift from capital growth alone to wealth preservation in a disciplined manner and i think that will do justice to the risks that we face today okay so that one more question from the participants like uh, does madp follow any upper cap limit for sectors like index and asset asset class like gold etc yes so we do have uh, caps on all the different asset classes uh, to give you a broader idea uh, we do not exceed 80% in equities at at a total portfolio level at any given point of time the capping on sector is not really relevant because we don't take sector exposures at all we only take asset class exposures and uh, the lowest equity will be in the range of 30% the highest will be in the range of 80% the minimum non equity exposure will be in the range of 20% of the total uh, portfolio and in between these ranges allocations keep evolving I don't have that data on this slide yet, uh, but I can probably get that sent to PMS Bazaar and PMS Bazaar can send it ahead to the clients who have this requirement. So, and uh, oh, one participant has asked, like, what indicators exactly do you use in a techno and momentum meter? So, in technicals, we have more like. eight different technical indicators which are a combination of uh, macd rsi hull uh, super trend and uh, those are some of the indicators we use but it's not just what indicators we are using the challenging part is how we are using these indicators so identifying that okay i want to invest in high quality stocks that is easy right but how to find high quality that is the challenge so it's more about how we use some of these technical indicators what kind of weights we give them how we use them as signals etc and in momentum we follow a dual momentum strategy a uh, dual momentum focuses on absolute momentum in all the asset classes and relative momentum across all the asset classes and therefore on a rolling one month three month six month one year basis we want to gauge whether the trend is changing at a particular asset class level or amongst these asset classes so in january uh, our momentum meter was the first to indicate that the trend is shifting gradually from equities to gold and therefore we were able to increase allocations from 8% to 21% to gold i hope that answers both the questions on momentum and the yeah. yeah. so and uh, finally most of the participants they were uh, very keen to know about your uh, no fee structure uh, uh what is the exit clause and other stuff so okay so uh there are two uh fee structures uh the one we do recommend to all the clients is a fixed fee of uh, 1.25% uh zero entry load zero exit load no lock in periods 1.25% is your uh management fee or your fixed fee and uh, 15% profit share above the 10% hurdle rate so 10% hurdle 15% profit 1.25% fixed fee this is the hybrid model 
and uh, a few investors over a long cycle have also preferred a fixed fee model i believe the fixed fees are at 2% and there is no profit share component in this right so basically you will use the higher what watermark level when you take absolutely. the hurdle rate absolutely the higher watermark is applicable right one second so and uh, one more question has come now. so it will take this is the last question so so he is asking like uh, uh, so when you are in your presentation you are saying that you are investing in short tenure bonds right so you have invested about 25% uh, uh, in edelweiss bharat bond et1 uh, does this contain only short duration bonds so these are corporate bonds which are short duration as compared to government bonds which are tenure bonds these are uh, rolling 3 year bonds so they have the ability to uh, revise with the movement in the interest rate cycle which a government bond does not have and even if you evaluate the performance of the three different duration which is long short and ultra short it's very evident that long duration bonds are penalized more heavily short duration bonds a little less and ultra short duration bonds are not been penalized at all and the also uh, the other reason is when we are parking funds in short duration bonds if you hold them to maturity you anyways get the yield to maturity and the whole capital back so it is tax efficient on a 3 year basis anyways and some of the very basic questions like i myself uh, address that so it is a, a pms product not a af product and the minimum investment for uh, this uh, pms scheme is uh, for 50 lakhs so any pms the minimum uh, investment is 50 lakhs so so uh, dear participants if you have any other uh, questions you can uh, know uh, write to us uh, at events at the rate of pmsbazaar.com so uh, we'll try to uh, collate all the questions and we'll get the answers from siddharth vara and we'll uh, send across to you uh, so with that note we will uh, uh, conclude this uh, webinar Uh, dear participants once again thank you for joining us for this insightful session and uh, thank you siddharth for sharing your knowledge and no and uh, uh, i hope that all the participants would have uh, gained uh, or understand about you uh, know the dynamic asset allocation the way that prabhudas sililader is you know uh, managing you uh, know uh, clients money and uh, wishing you a happy and safe weekend uh, thank you everyone thank you thank you